Well, good morning. morning. It's good to be in the house of the Lord, and it's always good to be with you all. And um, sometimes I fail to let you know just how important you are. And uh, I want to take a moment this morning, I did this in the first service, and just express my appreciation to you as a church family, just for the marvelous way that you have received and continue to receive me as one of your uh, pastors. I was in Atlanta the end of the week for a meeting with the General Board of, we call it GBHEM, General Board of Higher Education and Ministry. And there's a group of us that pastor large churches, that is 500 or more in attendance, whose, eth- whose primary e- ethnicity is not that of our own. So we call it cross-racial, cross-cultural appointments. And there's 19 of us uh, across the United States, and we gather together a couple times a year just to swap war stories and encourage one another. And this particular meeting, we gathered with newly appointed pastors who are serving for the first time in in primary ethnicities that are not their own and have a mentor coaching thing that we uh, have going on. And where I'm going with this is, as I sit and listen to some of the things that are happening around the country, uh, I am so grateful and thankful for you all. Uh, You all are really good Christian folks. Amen. And and I I say that with with as much love as I possibly can. I, I sit and listen to some of the stories of some of the pastors and the things that they have to endure And uh, I wonder, where is the Lord in some of the churches and the uh, experiences that they are sharing? Because Jesus couldn't get in with an ice pick. Uh, Not not here. That's not the case here. Um, You know, you all are are loving and receiving, and, and I feel affirmed and appreciated, and I just want you to know how much I love you, and, and thank you. Thank you for who you are. Well, let's... Um, Let's jump in with both feet. I'm going to share the scripture. And I do, I do not have a formal sermon today. I don't have three points in a poem. I don't even have two points in a poem. I've got, I've got one point and a question. That's the makeup of the sermon. They got out like 15 minutes early in the first service. So now, not that I'm keeping track, but I'm up 25 minutes. And I'm saving all of this time, and then we're going to change times, and I'm going to lose it all. But I understand right now, I'm, I'm good to go. I can go over for a long time in that, in that service. And I, and I won't, but that's where I'm at. That's where I'm at. Okay, our scripture lesson comes from the book of Acts, the eighth chapter. And uh, hear these words. And Saul approved of their killing him. Him is Stephen. That day a severe persecution began against the church in Jerusalem, and all except the apostles were scattered throughout the countryside of Judea and Samaria. Devout men buried Stephen and made loud lamentation over him. But Saul was ravishing the church by entering house after house, dragging off both men and women. He committed them to prison. Now those who were scattered went from place to place, proclaiming the word. Philip went down to the city of Samaria, and proclaim the Messiah to them. The crowds with one accord listened eagerly to what was said by Philip, hearing and seeing the signs that he did. For certain spirit, for unclean spirits crying out loud shrieks came out of many who were possessed, and many others who were paralyzed or lame were cured. So there was great joy in that city. Well, let's pray. Lord, I pray that you would give me grace to preach over the next few moments, and I just pray that you would give me the right words to say. And Lord, uh, just pray that you would clear up my head, that uh, I would have clarity of heart, thought, and mind, and that I would be able to function freely this morning. Thank you again for your blessings. In Jesus' name, amen. I ask for my head to become clear because the last three weeks I've had a, I've, I've gone to the doctor, and I've got a a clog in my in my head and uh 
I keep popping my ears and all that, but it just fills right back up. I got off the plane in Atlanta and took about three steps and almost passed out. And um, so I got the ground transportation and all that good stuff. And I'm perfectly fine. I'm not sick. It's just the doctor says it's just clogged up. It's allergies. And they gave me the medicine and stuff, but it's not doing a thing. So it's not working. So y'all, y'all pray. And, and uh, the good news is I won't be up here long. The end, of the, the end of the seventh chapter of the book of Acts closes with these words. It says that Stephen prayed a prayer of forgiveness. He prayed for those who were stoning him. Lord, don't hold this against them. And then it has this phrase. It said, he fell asleep. The, the next line begins in the 8th chapter, and Saul approved of their killing Stephen. I find it interesting that Saul approved his death, but Jesus arranged his sleep. Now, you'll have to really get that. They're pelting him with rocks. They have him in the stoning pit. They, they They are literally stoning this man to death, throwing rocks at him until he dies and he's covered with a with a heap of rocks. And the Bible says that for Stephen, because of the presence of Jesus being so strong in his life, that it was like he fell asleep. If you don't get that, you got to get that. Listen, he never promised to keep you out of the fiery furnace, but he promised to always walk with you in the flames. Lest I get going. It was St. Augustine who said that the church owes Paul to the prayers of Stephen. Saul the persecutor, that he was holding the garments of those who were casting the stones, and he was giving his consent. I think he heard, I know he heard the words that Stephen prayed. And I think it became a burr under his spiritual saddle that wouldn't let him go. You remember in, in the ninth chapter, if you get there and you're, and you're reading through the New Testament, that in the ninth chapter, he's on his way to Damascus. He's got letters to, to persecute, to arrest more Christians, and God knocked him off his, his high horse. I think that whole spiritual transition and transformation started with the prayers of Stephen. Well, here's what I do know, and this is the one point that I have for my message today. Pressure oftentimes produces power. Pressure oftentimes produces power. When you get in a desperate situation, when you have no other place to turn, and your spiritual prayer is reduced to one word, one word, one word, help. Help. (laughs) You know, you're in, uh, actually, that's not a bad position to be in. Because pressure produces power. There was a pressure, a persecution that was unleashed on that early church. And that early church felt the persecution. There were people being arrested. There were people being stoned. There were people being thrown into prison. Sometimes change happens because we need to fulfill the call that God has placed on our lives. The early church was stuck in Jerusalem. When I say they were stuck in Jerusalem, they were literally stuck in Jerusalem. That wasn't a bad thing. You read Acts 2.42, it says they all devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the breaking of bread. They had fellowship from house to house. The Lord added daily to the church who was being saved. The church was growing. They were were multiplying. They were sharing their resources one with the other. Nobody had a need. God was getting loose in the community. People were being healed. People were being delivered. People were being set free. Great things were happening, but they were in semi-disobedience because they weren't doing all that they were called to do. They were doing some things, and what they were doing, they were doing correctly, but it wasn't enough. How do I know that? Go to Acts chapter 1, verse 8. 
It says, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you shall be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the other parts of the world, ever-widening concentric circles. There's the gospel supposed to be moving out. They were stuck at Jerusalem. They weren't going anywhere. They were stuck in Jerusalem. They were enjoying it. Great things were happening. Good things were going, but they weren't doing enough. Oh, I, I'm, I, I really want to get loose this morning. <laughs> The service is not designed for me to go for it today. <laughs> and that was intentional. Listen, we, we do some great things. You all are a wonderful church. We do some great things in our community. We're getting outside of the walls of this church. I mean, we're getting involved in more and more things ministries that are making a difference in the kingdom of God and in the lives of, of people. Listen, people don't care what you know until they know that you care. Our church is getting more involved. We're involved in the school system. We're involved in the jail, juvenile uh, detention, juvenile jail system. We're involved in Roberts Park. We're involved in carrying cupboard. We're involved in CASA and getting more involved, and that's a good thing. We're getting more involved in things, and that's great. Listen, there's all kinds, there's ministries that we haven't even, we haven't even scratched the surface yet. One reason I'm excited is because God has given us gifts and graces and resources that can be used to make a difference in the community. Let me get to the end and then I'll back up, okay? But here's, here's where we're going with this. How do I know that God cares about the city? Look at the end line. It says, and joy came to that city. Great joy came to that city. God wants our cities to be places of joy and peace and happiness and prosperity. To be places of blessings. Not places where people are afraid to walk down the street or afraid to go in a certain community. God wants peace. And we are to be those instruments. Amen? Amen. Listen, if we want to make a difference, we've got to be the difference. I'm, I'm, I'm getting way... Okay, I'm going to settle down. Here, here's what, here's, here's what, what had happened was, as my daughter used to say to get out of trouble, what, what had happened was God had told them to go. Jesus had commissioned them to go, and they weren't going. Well, persecution meant that they got out of their comfort zones, and they had to go. And Philip went down to Samaria. Samaria was a place where uh, Samaria, the Samaritans were a, 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 a multi-ethnic racial group that wasn't accepted. And so they formed, they, they formed their own clustered community. They even developed their own temple and their own place to worship. You remember in, 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 um, in the encounter that Jesus had in John chapter 4 with the woman at the well? And she says, hey, you guys say, you big hotshot Jewish rabbi, you tell us that we're supposed to go to Jerusalem. My folks say we worship on Mount Gerizim. Which one is it? Where are we supposed to worship? And he said, the day's coming when the true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. It's not going to just be a locale. Aren't you glad that God doesn't limit us to a locale? We can be the church outside of the walls of the church? That's what God is calling us to do in greater, greater number. And why? Because God wants joy to come to the city. Listen, we have the power to affect change, personal change and corporate change. Our community is not doom and gloom. Only if we let it be doom and gloom. Because we are to be the salt and the light that makes a difference. So that early church, they had to move out, and Philip went out, and he went down to Samaria, and God got loose in the house in his cross-cultural, cross-racial appointment. God got loose in the house. Well, here's my question. I said I had one point, pressure produces power, and here's my one question. What are you willing to do for others to come to know Jesus? What are you willing to do for others to come to know Jesus? I know, I know, the, I know the Sunday school answer. The Sunday school answer is, Lord, I'll do what you want me to do. I'll say what you want me to say. I'll go where you want me to go. And then we don't even know who our neighbor is. Ouch. 
out. What are you willing to do for others to come to know Jesus? Let me give you three examples right out of this first, first passage of Scripture. Stephen was willing to be stoned. Let me, let me say some more about Stephen being stoned. Did you read that in the seventh chapter? <laughs> when he was being pelted with rocks, and the Bible says he, it was like him falling asleep. It wasn't like they were killing him, even though they were killing him. Jesus had already said, Lo, I'm with you always, even to the close of the age as they were pelting him with rocks. Look, look what Stephen said. I love this. I love this. I love this. Stephen said, hey, look, everybody. He says, I see Jesus seated or standing at the right hand of God. He's not seated. He's standing at the right hand of God. Stephen was coming home, and Jesus stood up to welcome him. And it was just like he was falling asleep. And in the twinkling of an eye, boom, he was, he was transformed. Yeah, they killed his body, but his spirit ascended to the throne of God. What are you willing to do for others to come to know Christ? Stephen's death produced the Apostle Paul. Philip went counterculture and cross-racial. The apostles endured persecution. They, they stayed as an anchor in Jerusalem. And then others went out. Philip went down to Samaria, and, and, and a little bit later, the, the Lord came and spoke to him and said, said you, you've got a great thing going down near Samaria, but the gospel is supposed to go past Samaria. And so he, he made it possible for the gospel to go into Ethiopia by sending him out to a desert road in chapter 8, the latter part, middle of chapter 8. He sent him out to a desert road, and there he encountered an Ethiopian eunuch and and shared. And then from that moment, listen, listen to this, Philip went down into the water, baptized this Ethiopian eunuch, and then the Bible says the, the, the Holy Spirit gave him a divine ride. He found himself at Azotus. And it has a little tagline that says, and he preached Christ there. Oh, my brothers and my sisters, wherever we find ourselves, we ought to be about the business of preaching Christ. Wherever we find ourselves, if we find ourselves in a, in a school situation, preach Christ. If we find ourselves in a factory situation, preach Christ. If we find ourselves working in a hospital, preach Christ. Now you've got to go according to the rules of the place that you're at. Don't get kicked out. But stealthily show them Jesus, by the way, first of all, that you live. What are you willing to do for others to come? to come to know Christ. And finally, here's where we're going. It says joy came to that city. That's what, that's what God wants. God wants joy in the cities. God didn't want turmoil and confusion. How do I know that? Because Jesus has already told us, you are a light. You are salt. We're called to make a difference in the city. So if our city's in a mess, it's our fault. It's our fault. We've got to be the light. We've got to be the salt. And we've got to show people a better way. Can I just say that it begins in the church? It begins in the church. How can the world know that we love outside of the church if we don't love inside of the church? And I'm going to leave that alone because that's a whole other message. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you again for being able to be conduits of your grace and your love. Help us wherever we find ourselves. Help us to be committed to preaching, to lifting up Jesus Christ. For he said, if I am lifted up, I'll draw men and women, boys and girls, unto me. Use us to make a difference. We ask this in the name of Christ. Amen and amen.